My first trip to Monterey Bay was, I think, in 1989, I'm pretty sure. Because I, because I was there for the very first time I attended a Marine Mammal Conference. Nice. The conference was actually in Pacific Grove, mm -hmm. but I made my way down to Monterey Bay at some point during that conference. And I remember that pretty well because I was also pregnant at the time. <laughs> and I was in my, just the beginning of my eighth month, so it was like the last time I could fly. I had to get special permission to fly over there. But I was very excited about it. I was, I was not a student. I didn't know about the society when I was a student. So I came to my first Marine Mammal Conference, actually, as a faculty member. But being pregnant did not stop me from investigating all of the marine life that I could get a hold of. I was so stunned. First of all, I looked west. And the sunsets were beautiful. I'm looking out over the Pacific Ocean, and the sun is setting over the Pacific Ocean. You know, in New York, when I look west, it's unset. You know what I see? I see New Jersey. I see oil refineries and, and ships that are docked there. It's not a very pretty sight to look west and see New Jersey for your sunset. So when I got, and at the time I was living in New Jersey. So when I got out to California, I was like, wow, you have the most beautiful sunsets here. I just can't tear myself away from the coast and looking at the sunset. And then I looked down and what I saw were seals on the rocks, like really close. Like I'd never seen a seal. I mean, I knew they existed, but in New York, you know, we don't have any shoreline that isn't hardened at this point, you know, all around Manhattan and New York. So seals don't come up and beach themselves because there's no beach. And if you go to a beach, it's like Jones Beach. It's like, you know, three million people on the beach. So no seal is going to come up there. So I had never seen a seal alive. I've seen dead ones. I, I do a lot of work in anatomy, so I see a lot of dead animals. So I saw these seals and pregnant me, I didn't care. I went, I climbed over the fence, I went down on the rocks, I got really close. This is before the age of digital cameras. I only had my little, you know, regular camera and I didn't have a zoom lens because all of my research work was on dead animals. They didn't move, I could get really close to them, so I didn't need a long lens. So I was like, I don't know if I can get a picture of these seals because I don't have a telephoto. And I got closer and closer and they didn't move. They just stayed there, they didn't seem to care. So I'd stayed, you know, far enough away that they couldn't bite me or anything, but I was just stunned that I could see them so well. And then the sea lions came in. I was like, oh my God, there's sea lions now too. And I didn't realize how different males and females were. That was the first time it really struck me that males are called sea lions because they have this giant mane around their head. You know, of, of, it's not really long for like a lion's mane, but, but there is this giant thing. And then they opened their mouth and they belched. Well, okay, that was their roar. It's like a lion roar, but it was this big belch. I thought, oh, okay, now I get why they're calling them sea lions. So that was my first introduction. And then I went from, from Pacific Grove down to Monterey and I saw the aquarium. Now, oh, aquarium's cute. They have the sea otters, which are adorable. Everybody falls in love with the sea otters. But the thing that grabbed me the most was the aquarium was having this wonderful display of jellyfish, of all things, and they were the most beautiful things I'd ever seen. I, before that, hated jellyfish. They're, they're, they're nasty things that sting you, and you never want to see one when you go in the ocean. But they had them in this really cool display with these beautiful blue backgrounds, and soft music was playing, and they, they put a little bit of a current in the tank, and it made them swirl around, and, and they had this great lighting on them, like ultraviolet light, and things were glowing, and they were the most beautiful things. of like flowers floating around in circles. And I was mesmerized. They couldn't get me out of the aquarium. It was closing, and I was still there looking at these tanks. So that was my first introduction to that area. So of course I had to come back. So I made liaisons with friends who were working in Santa Cruz and said, I want to do some anatomy out here. So I got invited back and we got to work on elephant seals. Now, elephant seals are pretty cool animals. And most people think they're mad ugly, but I think they're really, really interesting. Especially when they open, the males, when they open their mouth and they start to you know, make these giant bellowing noises that, that are sort of, you know, like, what is going on with these things? And I thought it was coming out of their nose because they had this giant elephant like nose. But I, I came to realize that the nose was simply blocking the mouth while the climbing like climbing. And if it's blocking the mouth, it makes these punctuated sounds. So I thought that was really, really cool. So I wanted to get a really close up view of them. I went out with some of the people who were working in the area. Uh, Guy Oliver took me out on, a, on an expedition along the beach. 
I did not realize that with the right blue jacket and the right permissions, you could actually walk right up next to these things. I was terrified at first because you know each one of them is like the size of a truck. They're huge, <laughs> really, really, really big. Uh, but mostly they're very lazy. So unless you, you piss them off, they're not going to you know hurt you. But I really had to avoid the business end. I would walk around the tail. That was fine, and we would look at the tags. And if they weren't facing the right way. Guy would like reach down and yank on the flipper so we could get the tag visible. And then they would turn around and was like, okay, I'm out of here. And I would back way up, but I would watch this whole scene as he was doing like, like a bullfighter, this dance around with these elephant seals to, just so we can get the tag, so we can get a picture of the tag and see what number it was. I was stunned that you could be that close to them. And then we went over to see some of the females. They were adorable. They just lie there, you know, just relaxing like they're at a spa. And he said, you could get really close to them if you lay down. I said, really? So I laid down like I was a seal, and I was able to snug up pretty close to them. And I thought, this can't be legal, what I'm doing. He says, well, you're under research permit, so it's okay. You're here to get pictures of them, and you need to get close. So, so that's what I did, and I got a lot of really great pictures of them. But somehow in the snuggling down in the sand, I lost my g big, giant purple hat. So someday, you're going to see an elephant seal out there wearing my big purple hat, because it was cold that day. I never found it. I'm sure it's sitting on top of some elephant seal's head out there. So then we got into some elephant seal research, and that meant recovering a specimen. Now these are big, big animals, so it's really hard to recover a specimen from them. So what I remember was getting, I got a call from Sarah Keenley, and she had gone out to, to recover this elephant seal that had died. But it's really big. So it's like, she's like, I can't bring the whole thing back, so where should I cut it? So I'm giving her directions over the phone, and she's trying to cut this thing off so we can get the specimen that we need. And she ended up putting it on like a kid's snowboard sled, you know, like th those sled things you get on the hill with that you hold on the sides. So it's like a little plastic toboggan. It's something like that. She put it on something like that, and they were dragging the specimen across the beach, which at this point was probably only a fifth of the whole animal, but it was still humongous. And then she said, you got it in the freezer, now you have to fly over and see it. So of course I did, and then I wrangled a few other people to come and help me. Uh, Jody, for example, was there taking pictures. Uh, we had a wonderful experience. We got to dissect all of the muscles of this area, really understand how these animals are put together and how they're able to, to move their mouth and to, to bite things and to, to make sounds. We're looking at the larynx, which is the voice box, and how they make sounds. My other experience in Monterey Bay was actually, I was there for some filming. We were doing work for PBS on a series called Big Blue Live. So just before the series started filming, I had an opportunity to go out and see. So I went out on Fast Draft, and, and Kate Spencer's a friend of mine, she took me out, and I got to see a whole bunch of firsts. For me, they were firsts. It was the first time I'd ever seen a blue whale. It was the first time I'd ever seen dolls, porpoises. It was the first time I'd ever seen killer whales. It wasn't the first time I'd seen a great white shark, but we did see a great white shark. It was the first time I saw a uh, ocean sunfish, Mola Mola. Um, and I don't remember what else we saw at this point because my, my head is so boggled up with it. But we did get some pretty good views of humpback whales, which are really, really cool animals. Now, I will tell you a story that didn't happen to me, but happened to a colleague of mine while we were filming for Big Blue Life. We were out in that area, and I, I was there to talk about sea otter fur and humpback baleen and all these other great little things, all about the anatomy. That was my role. But at the same time that this was all happening, there were people out there on the water, and they were filming. One of the people who was out there was actually not involved with Big Blue Life, but he was out there at the same time this was happening. He was in a kayak with his girlfriend, and he went out to go see humpbacks really close on the kayak. But you know, you have a setback. You can't get that close. So he was properly obeying the setbacks and was watching a pod that was feeding that was more than 200 yards away. And they just were just lolling around in the water. They weren't even going anywhere. They were just sort of lolling around watching these humpbacks feeding. And then out of nowhere, a humpback breached right in front of him that they did not know was there. And it landed on his kayak and plunged the kayak down. This whole incident got caught on video by someone who was on one of the whale watch ships. I didn't know that this had happened at the time, but after I got back home and I was communicating with my friend Tom, and uh, his name is Tom Mustill, and Tom was, um, he, he's actually a filmer. He had directed some episodes that I had been in on other TV series. And so he sent me an email saying, I was in Monterey Bay when you were there filming, and guess what happened? I got breached on by a humpback whale. And I was like, no, you're just joking me, aren't you? He goes, no, 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 it really happened. I, and then he showed me this clip 
I was like, wait a minute, I'd seen that clip, it ran viral, everybody was seeing this clip. I said, that was you? No, you're just kidding me, right? Because no, it actually really was me. <laughs> so I thought, that's pretty bizarre. So I started looking at the clip a lot more closely, because my first impression was, what an idiot, why are you so close to humpback whales? But then he told me, he wasn't close to the whales, this one came out of nowhere. They were very far from the whales that they were watching. So I'm looking at this video clip, and I'm watching it frame by frame by frame by frame. And as I'm looking at it, I'm realizing this humpback did not do a normal breach. Normally when humpbacks jump up, they jump up and they, they arc backwards because the head is so heavy. And, and the back of their head with the skull is, is much heavier than the front with just the throat. It's assuming there's no water in it. They're not feeding, okay? So as they arch up to come out of the water, they end up usually landing backwards on the back of their head. This whale started to do that, but I think as it arched, and often they twist a little bit, you could see the kayak out of one eye. And I think the whale was like, oh crap, I have to move. There's something in the way. And it purposely turned in a way that was not consistent with how it was arching. And it didn't land on its back like it normally would. It ended up landing on its side. And I think the whale purposely tried to avoid the kayak because I think it saw the kayak at the last minute. It didn't know it was there and was breaching, but saw and really tried hard not to hit the kayak. So this whale was not trying to breach on top of my friend and his girlfriend. This whale tried to avoid them, and it was only because of the, it had to turn. You have to bring the flippers around to turn, just like when ice skaters make a twist. You know, they use their arms like this and they spin. So the whale did that with its flippers, and it made a spin. And one of the flippers hit the kayak and actually dented in the front of the kayak. If the whale had actually not done that, the back of the skull, which is you know the size of, of a couch, okay, would have hit the kayak and it probably would have killed them but it didn't, so they lived. And they, came, they, they got plunged under, because as the whale hit everything, you know, it, it sucked everything down with the pressures of you know, pushing them down. But when they popped up again, they were laughing because they couldn't believe that they were that close to a humpback whale, but they also didn't realize how close they were to death.